All right, guys, as always, I will be enhancing the audio of this video. And I'm also going to enhance Coach's audio extra this video. Because last video, uh, someone said they could not hear Coach. So I'm going to make sure I enhance it. As always, we're going to be adding all the questions on the screen of the reporters and enhanced audio for the reporters. Now, I will be stopping this uh, as it goes through and kind of give my thoughts, opinions, and everything. So if you don't watch it without all that stopping and stuff, I will leave it linked down below in the description. Since I Bengals post this on the YouTube channel, but today we're going to be doing reaction. So, yeah, it's going to be me reacting. Let's go and get right into it. All right. Of note... Not necessarily. Some guys will miss a little bit of time. You know, Cody Ford yesterday had a concussion in practice, so he's in the protocol. Uh, Marvell Tell, same thing from the game, concussion protocol. So Marvell uh, missed practice yesterday. Uh, DJ Turner, just some soreness, so he didn't do a lot yesterday. Continue just to see him day-to-day -day from there. Um, we'll limit BJ Hill. He had some soreness, just lower body soreness yesterday, so we'll limit him. Those are the ones that stand out in my mind, unless there's somebody else specific. That's interesting, actually. And this is probably going to get even worse next week. Because you got to think. So, DJ Turner, right? After week one, we didn't really see many players have too much soreness and miss training camp after that. But now that they're in two games in, and about to be three games this upcoming Saturday versus the Commanders, this is going to... I mean, we're going to see a lot of these players not go down. But they're going to be, like, destroyed before the season starts. So, hopefully everyone goes good. Luckily, the concussion protocol for Cody Ford should not be that long. Probably at the most one week. Um, maybe two weeks, depending on how bad it is. Yeah, Miles is getting over his illness. So, he was, he was better yesterday and expect better today. I saw Cheeto work a little bit in 7-7. Seven yeah. seven, so I mean, yep. Really good, and we'll just see. You know, we don't have seven on seven today, um, so again, we'll just we'll continue to play it day to day of when we start to incorporate him into team drills. But he's done everything that's been asked of him, and and um, you know everything so far has looked good. And we'll just continue to manage him slowly as we integrate him into drills. How hard has it been to to manage him? Because I know he wants to get out of it. Yeah, but you know he he understands where we're coming from. He understands the time frame of what's going to be needed to get ready for the season. And so he's had a, you know, to my really good perspective about the whole thing and um, has really attacked it the right way. I think that really does go down to a lot of veteran players. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, veteran players, I feel like, are, like, the easiest but also the hardest to not have on the field, right? Because at the end of the day, a lot of veteran players are kind of like, I don't want to say hard asses, but they've been around the league, right? So they're like, oh, yeah, man, my arm hurts, but I I'm okay. I'll, I'll go back out there, coach. I can go play. And then they're like, the as a coach or like a training staff, you got to be like, no, 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 no. You can't go back out there. Because if you go back out there, we have seen your injury in the past, and we know that this could cause this injury or could linger here or could mess up here. So as a team, you have to be like, no, you're not allowed to do this. And this is a grown man you're telling this to, by the way. You're not telling this to a kid. You're telling this to like a 28, 29-year-old Cheeto. Like, we understand that you feel like you can play, but no, you're going to have to listen to us because we know more than you medically. It's such a weird thing. But then also, there are probably some veterans who are like, you know what? You know what you're doing. I'm not going to question it. We're good. But it's probably like the two ends of the spectrum. One is like, no, I don't care. I'm a veteran. I know what I'm doing. And the other one is, you guys know what you're doing. I'm good. What makes Troy Walters one of the best in the business? Uh, I think you start with the person, number one. And it's somebody that everybody can respect just because of the way that he, he carries himself and lives his life. And one of the best people I've ever been around. Um, spends a lot of time on his craft. He's, he's somebody that not only has done it at an extremely high level, but at the same time, uh, continues to work on that to hone it he's not just someone okay i did it so what i say goes he spends a lot of time studying it and um it stays on his guys that's a really hard it could be a really intimidating group to coach if if you didn't have the correct mindset to do it because they're so talented they're at the top of their game um but he keeps raising the standard with that group and is very demanding of them and they respect the heck out of that because those are the types of guys they are and so, I mean, he's someone that, you know, you immediately sought to add to your staff when he was available because I'd worked with him at A&M. I knew, I knew all these things that came with Troy. And uh, so, again, he's been a home run hire, um, home run person, and we're very lucky to have him. That energy is same back at A&M back in the day. 
Yeah. You know, it's, we were both kind of in the infancy stages of coaching. I was, a um, when Troy came, I was, uh, I was in my third year coaching probably. I think he was in his second, he'd been at Indiana state for a year or two, maybe. And then we hired him as the receiver coach. So he was still, he was still, he was older than me, obviously, but in the infancy stages of his coaching. So he was, he was learning how to coach as well, you know, um, but, but did a great job developing those guys we had there. Can you imagine having to coach Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd? Like, as Coach said, but like, listen, like, Jamar Chase is the best of the best, right? And he's one of the youngest receivers on that receiving core I just listed, right? T. Higgins, I think, is a top 10 receiver in the NFL. And honestly, both of those first two are going to be Hall of Famers one day, right? So it's like, you're like, hey, listen, I, I've seen stuff in college I've seen as a coach. I've seen stuff in the NFL. You have to do this, this, and this. This is exactly what I want you to do, right? And as Coach said, he was still in his infancy stage, so he's, you know, not too much experience. Coming into a game, coming into a team where you got to be like, listen, I understand you're a future Hall of Famer, but this is what I think you should do. And it's like, at the same time, you got to work with those guys because those guys are all going to be Hall of Famers. So you got to be like, and they're like, no, 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 this is what I want to do. And you're like, okay, but we're going to work around this too. Like that takes a strong person slash a good leader to compromise and work with the player. Because a lot of coaches, they're, they're hard asses. They're, they're like, I don't care what you say or what you want. I'm the coach and I know best. So yeah, shout out to him for that. What's your view of the backup quarterback battle right now? You know, it's. Uh, I thought both guys did some things that we needed to see in the game, managing the two-minute situations at the end there. Um, you know, that, that race is not over yet. Um, we've talked to both those guys. We'll, we'll keep that in-house where it stands today, you know, and let them get through this game. That decision's not been made. Um, but we've got three days of work left this week, and then we got a game, and then we have to make the decision. So we've communicated with those guys on where things are right now. Um, I'll keep it internal for the time being. But certainly after this game, we, we've got to make a decision because time's running out before obviously, the first game. Obviously, you guys would be always doing due diligence on if there's other options outside that you would look into. How challenging would it be to have another quarterback have to come in a week before this, the, the opener and be the backup? I mean, is that something that's even feasible in your eyes, or how hard is that? I think anything's feasible. But at the same time, there, there are a lot of nuances to our offense where when you're asking a guy to learn that quickly and – be able to operate in a game, it's a challenge. Um, challenge in any system. I think it's a challenge in our system. Uh, these guys, I like where they're headed mentally with our system. I like where they're headed physically in terms of operating uh, with the urgency and the communication that we want, the accuracy. I think both of them have gotten better over training camp. I've been really pleased with that. Um, so again, two guys that are really headed in the right direction right now. And again, a couple more practices, see how it shakes out. Yes. That means that there's a, that if there, uh, yeah, that means what he said right there means that if they can pick up another quarterback and one becomes available they like, they will be picking them up. That's what that means because if he was, you know, let's say 1000% we were not going to pick up another quarterback and it wasn't going to happen, he would not say it like that. He would have been like, we like the guys we have and we want to see what we can get out of the guys we have. That would be the answer. If you're not going to pick up another quarterback, no matter what, and that's like, it's not going to happen, right? But instead, he was like, listen, if there's a chance, yeah, we could go look for another quarterback. If we, you know, someone else honestly becomes available who's good enough. But again, as he said, and I said this before my video, it's going to be nearly impossible to bring in a brand new receiver. I'm sorry, brand new quarterback. What? Maybe week uh, to play one preseason game get one or two weeks of actual, you know, process with these guys, and then you're the backup quarterback, and you're never going to play with the number ones probably the rest of the season. So if you ever have to come in the game, you're not going to get much chemistry, if anything, with T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd. You might get chemistry with Yoshi. You might get chemistry with Charlie Jones, but you're not going to get chemistry with the starters. So it's like, they come in, but at the same time, they're not going to have any chemistry with these guys. And it's just going to be a mess. So that's why I'm so iffy about the idea of them bringing in another quarterback. And I'm like, I don't know if it's going to work out in the end. I don't know if they bring another quarterback in, if he's going to have enough time to get that experience with the guys. 
I mean, if they would have brought another quarterback in maybe week two, week three. I'm sorry, not week two, week three. Maybe, like, after week one, I would have been like, oh, that's plenty of time. You get two preseason games, and you have, like, three weeks of play time with these guys before the season starts. But at this point, we're really getting close to it's not going to be worth it. Say the safest, the, the best case scenario for you is one of those two guys really establishes and takes it on Saturday and you feel comfortable going ahead with them not to look at it. Yeah, and we in, incorporate the practice as well. You know, we've, we've got plenty of opportunities in practice that we build in to be able to assess those guys. And um, so, again, we'll take in the full picture and, and make a decision from there. Is the plan to get one the first half and one the second half again? Probably not that long. Um, I'd like to see Reed get in the game, you know, so so we'll get Reed in the game in the fourth quarter, maybe maybe sooner than that. Uh, but those other guys will certainly get some time yet. Uh, specifically, you know, you go into a game saying, all right, they're probably going to get the same amount of time, how that's going to shake out. I mean, their first drive took 10 minutes the other day, you know, and so if you went in saying, all right, so-and-so's getting the first, so-and-so's getting the second, you'd immediately change your opinion after that first 10-minute drive. So um, I've just learned you just got to be flexible with those decisions. You wouldn't alternate guys, right? Not in series, no. I'd let one guy play and then the next guy go on. Yeah. Being able to clear Mitchell Wilcox today, mm -hmm. at this point, because you guys have so much familiarity with him, is it assumed that he is the number three tight end one, or is he in competition with Tanner? And where do things stand with him coming back and that uh, number three? There's a lot of trust with Mitch um, just from the time that, that he's been here over the last three years. Um, but certainly everyone's still competing for those jobs. And, and until things are all done, you know, no one's, no one's submitted them, their status anywhere. And so now you get a chance to see him do the physical part of things, you know, have contact and, and see how quickly he can get his feet back under him that way. He hasn't done anything in, in many months in terms of physical nature of, of contact. And so, uh, but pleased with where Mitch is at, pleased with how his rehab's gone. And now he's in a space where, where we can get him into practice, see how he looks. That's interesting. Not about Mitchell Wilcox, about the one before that. He said that, you know, the plan was to eventually get, you know, Reed in there, which obviously, listen, at the end of the day, Reed is, we got him from the XFL for a reason, right? We got two quarterbacks, Sinnott and Reed, for the reason of we want to, you know, see if they can, you know, do something in training camp and processes and also see if they maybe are the guy, right? I mean, if they play pretty good in preseason, maybe they're, and they end up being, you know, the best option. But as he said, like, you know, when you have the drives, and especially because the last two weeks, our defense hasn't been bad, but we've been really giving up a lot of yards. We've been locking down when we need to in the red zone, but giving up a crap ton of yards before that. And when you do that, you give up a crap ton of time. And those drives aren't short and sweet. They're like, as he said, 10-minute drives. And that's a couple drives last week were like six, seven-minute drives against us. So it's definitely one of the situations where I feel like, again, if you have a limited play time, you want to see as much as humanly possible from the guys you actually think can win the starting job. But still. Like yeah, normal, normal. When a guy is kind of getting ready for the season, but watching other quarterbacks and not being able to watch your own tape, as a guy can play quarterback, what's that challenge like, and how, how does someone be good at watching tape? Well, I think everybody's a little bit different, you know, and he's he's at the level he is for a reason. Um, again, this isn't his for, I, I can't, I can't tell you. I never, I was fortunate to, to never have an injury like, like he's sustained. Um, so I, I can't put myself in his shoes, but again, he's gotten himself to this, this spot for a reason. And over the last three years, he's had to deal with similar circumstances. So again, he's, he's a veteran at this. How do you see the, how do you see the backup swing tackle, uh, thing going to Jackson, uh, go out to the I saw really good things with Jackson. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to name roles or anything like that, but I, I thought Jackson um, had a good performance the other night and showed some really positive things. Brian yesterday was saying that it's a little bit different this year with Burrow because he didn't lose the weight that he did yeah. with the appendectomy yeah. and he wasn't really able to put weight on, on certain parts of his body. So is there a certain amount of time that you would think he would need to be able to get through a full, a full reps of practice for him to be able to play week one, or is it something where you just kind of... One rep. He needs one rep. Uh, <laughs> no, it, but it's different. It's a different injury. Um, 
you know, I would imagine, I hate speaking for other people, but last year it's an unknown. How is contact going to feel? How is it going to feel when I torque? There's a lot of things with an internal injury that I can't speak to. I would imagine that that's a whole different uh, mindset you have to have. Whereas this one's, you know, in the calf and he looks great. I mean, physically just, just walking around, he looks probably as good as he's ever looked at this point. And so um, that's, that's a positive. And we'll just go from there. Has he been covering enough? We, we saw him throw, obviously. Mm-hmm. Are you having him throw regularly? I assume. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Has he recovered enough yet, Zach, in his recovery from the calf spring that we're starting to put together a plan for him to return to practice? We've had a plan throughout, you know, and so that's just something that daily, since the day it happened, we go through and, and decide what's going to be best for the next day. Back to Browning, just what are the qualities you'd like to battle with, bringing him in, keeping him around? And yeah. Him in I think, you know, Jake has now been here for several years. Um, and so he, he understands the system, how you want to operate. So that, that's an advantage he had from the jump. Um, I think that he has, has, his urgency has continued to increase lately. I really like that. Uh, he's, um, he does a great job just as a leader. Guys believe in him, and as he moves around and operates, there's a confidence there that, that guys have, and you see that from Trevor as well. Uh, but Jake's, you know, you can see why he's had a really successful high school career, really successful college career. He's getting these opportunities in the league um, to fight his way up. A depth chart, you know, really has been the story of his career, and he's approached it the right way. Um, very likable guy. That's that's critical from backup quarterbacks that they get along with everyone in the building and, and they fit in well with the quarterback room and the coaching staff. And and I think that's what you've really seen from from Jake and Trevor both. They both fit that criteria. And that, that's a necessary criteria in my eyes. Back, some coaches would like maybe a change of pace from their backup quarterback, give the defense something that they haven't prepared for all week versus having a backup quarterback who essentially mimics what the, you know, the starting quarterback does, mm-hmm. and knows the system that the starting back quarterback you know operates under do you have a preference yeah the former you know certainly two schools of thought there i would imagine mine has always been you know a guy who operates similar to how your starter operates and you know we wouldn't all of a sudden become a a zone read team and then doing all this stuff that would require a a quarterback that you want to put in harm's way more often than not because of their skill set um so we tend to like guys that that can throw from the pocket um as their number one trait and I think that's the guys that we have right now. That's literally why if you look at behind Lamar Jackson, they have Lamar Jackson, Tyler Huntley, and Josh Johnson. All three quarterbacks are mobile quarterbacks who don't have the greatest arm. So it's like the most perfect comparison. So, yeah. You see from Charlie Jones as a punt not, not a lot of opportunity, right? So it's, it's a small sample size. Um, secures the ball when he catches it. And that's good. Uh, time on task will be critical, you know, and so we just we haven't gotten a lot of um, returns the way that the two games have shaken out so far. We, we've obviously divvied it up amongst several guys. Uh, so, again, just just time on task. I think it will continue to help him. He's gotten plenty of returns in college and and we work it in practice different in a game, obviously. Um, so we'll continue to get those guys more work, hopefully in this third game. Shedrick Jackson had a pretty productive game in mm-hmm. Atlanta. Anything specific stand out about areas he's improved since he's coming? Yeah, I think he's caught on to what we want um, just just from a, a knowledge of the offense standpoint pretty quickly. He's a guy that I've gained trust in, that he's going to line up correctly and do the right thing, which which can be can be challenging for new receivers in this offense because we don't we don't really miss a beat from previous years. We're, we're hitting the ground running pretty quickly because we have – you know, many guys back from last year. Um, and so it's a challenge for those new receivers. I think Shed has done a really good job of, I guess, studying time with Troy and Brad, however he's gone about it. I've got trust that he knows what to do and, and he'll make a play when the ball comes his way. Do you like the, uh, the versatility and the different types of players you have in the group? Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's a, um, we've got many guys in there. They're all competing. Um, they've all got their redeeming qualities. And, and again, that'll be a position we continue to evaluate on how it's going to look, you know, at the final decision time next week. Back to Charlie Jones, have, have you had conversations with him or do you have a sense of, of how much pain he's actually played through? With that well, I just uh, from experience dealing with other guys, I, I know that that's a challenge, you know, initially weeks after, week and media after. We've dealt with this with Logan. We've dealt with this with T. Um, there's been several other guys that I'm, I'm not mentioning right now, but um, it is a plus that he's continuing to play through that. And, and we know that deep down there, there's 
probably. I'm, I'm speaking for him again. He hasn't said this to me, but um, there's probably a little nagging there. Game reps are, are probably most critical in your evaluation process. Obviously, you have to see if guys can play in the game, but practice snaps. Is it a tiebreaker? Is it more than that in your evaluation process? How does is, how is the body of work of all those practices weigh against uh, game reps? Everything. I mean, everything weighs in. And, man, does one weigh more than the other? It can change by position. It can change by the amount of opportunities people have had in one or the other, um, how they factor into special teams, how other positions are measured, injuries at other positions. There's so many things that can weigh into the final cuts. Your message to guys is just control what you can control. Make the most of your opportunities when you get the reps you have. And and you're not necessarily competing with a guy at your position like you always assume. You could be competing with someone somewhere else and just, just continue to provide value and show that you deserve it to be here. And, and ultimately, we'll, we'll, we'll have to make those final decisions. And you've coached Joe Mixon a long time. What are the expectations? I'm sorry, say that one more time. Coach Mixon now for Mixon, yeah. five years, seven years. What do you expect from him this season? And what makes this a successful year for him? Yeah, I think just as an offense, we want to continue to operate at a very high level, be one of the top offenses in the league, and score points. How many rushing yards a game or how many passing yards a game we have does not matter to me. Um, we just want to be one of the top scoring teams in the league, do a great job uh, possessing the ball when we need to, you know, and, and keeping our defense off the field and controlling the game that way. And and I think that things will shake out how we want them to. So that's, that's just the key for the entirety of the offense. You spent last week hammering on the, the idea of discipline and being – more responsible in that regard. Yep. I'm just curious. I know it's not something you want to see, but how did Jordan Bauer respond after the talking As we had hoped, you know, and that's um, for young players, they got to learn that we're off the field there, you know, after the third down, and then they get a chance to continue the drive. And there's just such room, uh, so it's little room for error in these in these real games, and guys have to understand that, and he knows that. He's played at a high level at a high, high big team, and um, it's a good learning lesson. Sometimes I, I'm happy that these flags get thrown. I'm mad in the moment at the officials for throwing it. I was trying to defend our guys a little bit, but um, when you see it, how it unfolded, it was it was a good flag. Um, not only was it the right call, but it was it was probably good for all of our young guys to to learn from that and how it can. Impact. Yeah, in all honesty, I'll be honest. Uh, he's saying it the nice way, but that conversation with Lou, with uh, Jordan Battle. If you guys did not see the game last week, pretty much what happened was. It was a third down, I think third down and eight. They threw a deep pass down the right-hand sideline. The pass was broken up. And Battle actually played a good play on the ball. He ended up taunting the guy after the play is over, you know, getting in his face, and drew a 15-yard penalty, which obviously continued the drive. Now, that after that incomplete pass, they would have kicked the field goal. In the end, they kicked the field goal. So it's not like we give up a touchdown. But they could have given up a touchdown. And I promise you, Lou was not very nice about the situation, probably. Now, my guess is, knowing Jordan Battle again, he has played at a very high level in college. He probably said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's the best thing you can honestly do in those situations. Is just sit there and say, yes, sir. I understand. I messed up. I'm sorry. I'll do better. This I'm going to do better. Blah, blah. But nonetheless, though, love to hear, Coach. As always, guys, tell me down below your thoughts and opinions. I'll see you at the next one.